When, is it, when I was in my first full-time work, it was the spring of 1969, and in the county seat of Calhoun County, Arkansas, Hampton, being, I guess, the new preacher in town, they asked me to do the baccalaureate sermon for the graduating seniors of the Hampton High School, which I did. And of course, when you got a town about 11, 12, 1,300 people, you've got a lot of folks there that you don't get a chance to normally speak to. In the process of preaching, <clears throat> you had all sorts of sizes in that audience. Well, at the end of the thing, and I was visiting with different people, people I'd never met and so on, and a black man came up who was a member of the Baptist church. And he said, would you consider speaking to us? I was like, certainly I consider it, but we need to do some talking first, and I need to talk to the brethren. So he said, well, I, I, we, we would like to, after hearing you today, have you come speak to us maybe on Sunday afternoon. I said, okay. So I went back and told the people around about what was going on and whatever, and nobody had a problem with it. Well, at least some didn't. And uh, he said, now this was way out in the country. It, that whole county's country anyway. So it still is. But this was way outside of that little town. So it was, it, it was where they invented the word out in the sticks. <laughs> and it was a relatively nice building from the standpoint of size and quite a large congregation. So we set the date. And they told me, said, now you're going to be the first white preacher to preach here. Since a uh, carpetbag and Yankee came down right after the Civil War and established the church there. <laughs> now, they didn't use carpetbag and Yankee, but that's what it was. Anyway, I said, You mean all these years, over 100 years? I said, Yep. Yeah. Well, I don't know how he knew all that, but that's what he said. So, uh, we considered the preliminaries, and I said, now, I'm going to say things that uh, you're not used to hearing. Because I already decided I was going to speak on the restoration of primitive, pure New Testament Christianity. Which would cause me to have to speak for a while, but you must understand, they, uh, in their customs, and I think still are in a lot of places, would come in the morning and stay all day. In fact, when we got there that afternoon, they were, had been there since that morning. So I don't remember whether it was 2 o'clock or somewhere around about that time. It might have been 2.30. We got there, and so they uh, took me back in the back room and get things ironed out before everybody comes out. And they said, how do you want to be announced? I said, well, you can just announce me as being the preacher for the Hampton Church of Christ. Are you sure that's all you want said? I said, yes, that's all I need to have said, my name and that, and I'll know where I'm from. So now I understand now if you want to be called doctor, if you want to be called reverend or right reverend or most reverend, so just let us know. We'll be glad to call you whatever you want to be called. <laughs> I said, no, I'd just soon you dispense with all of those and just call me David Brown, the preacher for the uh, Church of Christ in Hampton. So they did. But that brings up what I wanted to preach on today, and that is, why aren't preachers in the Church of Christ referred to as reverend? Because the denominations have reverend, right reverend. Um, I don't know, they even have something that goes beyond right reverend. I've forgotten what that is. But anyway, all sorts of things of that nature. So if people don't think anything about it. I couldn't expect more of them than that because of their background and what they believe. I might indicate, since we have mentioned that, that I preached for probably two hours that afternoon on the restoration of New Testament Christianity, preached what faithful members of the church have heard all their life, but they hadn't, and got all sorts of responses, and all of them were good. I don't know how much they 
took it all to heart, but they heard something they did not normally hear. But now I mentioned the word reverend. The word reverend, R-E-V-E-R-E-N-D, appears in the King James Version and in the American Standard Version, 1901, in Psalm 111, verse 9. And it is used there strictly to apply to God. And that psalm reads, He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. Now I would emphasize this. The only time that the word reverend is found in the Bible is in Psalm 111 and verse 9. When I consult Brown, Driver, and Briggs Hebrew lexicon, I learned that the word reverend translates the Hebrew word yare. And it may be defined to fear, to revere, to be afraid. So the one whose name is reverend is identified in the text as the same one who sent redemption to his people and commanded his covenant forever and that one is God. Now a very common abuse of this word among religious people as you know is to apply it as a title and as a title to mere fallible men and to women <laughs> in some cases. And I really don't know what's going to happen with today's modern jargon and attitudes because now you don't know some of them whether they're men or women, so I guess they're just reverend so-and-so. I don't know what you would do when you get yourself into that situation, and they don't either because there is no respect for the authority of God's word or that it even is God's word. So I would like to look at various reasons why it's wrong to call men reverend or anything like that. Paul said to the Corinthian brethren in 1 Corinthians 4 in verse number 6 that we're not to think of men more highly than that which is written or above that which is written. Man needs to know his place. Now I realize that's language you don't want to use nowadays. Do you know your place? But it's true. Do I know my place in this world to live as God says I ought to live in this world? Do I know my place when I'm studying the Bible? Am I realizing it is the word of God? It is sacred. It is divine. It did not come from the mind of man. It came from God to show me how to serve God and to exalt him the way he wants to be exalted. In fact, if you read further what Paul said here, he made it clear that it was wrong to do that and that it would constitute being puffed up one against another when we begin to try to exalt, as Christians, one above another. You can see there was a problem of that in the use and misuse of miraculous gifts in the church in Corinth. Those who were speaking in languages they had never studied by a miracle were saying, don't you wish you could do what I do? And they were looking at the other gifts as not being nearly up to snuff, as we used to say, when it came to speaking in tongues or languages. And thus Paul had to write 1 Corinthians 13, which says if you do what's right but you do it for the wrong reason, that is, not out of love, then whatever you do is, as far as God's concerned is like a kicking a can down the road to make it jangle and jingle. It's worthless. 
He even said, if you give your body to be burned, but you do it for some other reason than the proper love, it doesn't accomplish anything. Which shows that the motive must be right. We must understand biblical love, and we must act out of love. So there's one reason that it's wrong. We should not do things that would make us exalt one person above another. It is in man to do that. We see a person with a high degree of formal education. Maybe that person may not have that, but he or she may uh, be thought of highly in the community or for some other reason. And we say, oh, look who that is. We had a problem with that back in the first century. James dealt with it where wealthy people were making the poor people uh, have to be in the poor seats of the house when they shouldn't have. It's easy to do that and to think that uh, we're something special. But in the church, everybody is on an equal par. When it comes to practicing what God wants done to be saved, everybody, regardless of race, ethnicity, wealth, age, obeys the same gospel in the same way. And I worship today, if acceptable to God, according to the authority of the scriptures, we all worship the same way. So that's the way we ought to understand things. That's the way it was meant. That's what Paul meant in Galatians chapter 3, the last two or three verses of that chapter. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. That's the idea. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't different offices in the church because he makes it clear there is. But in so far as the way we worship God and the way we serve God, we're directed all by the same word and everybody has the same view of God and the way we approach him. So we do all we can to make it that way. There's another reason that calling someone reverend as far as being a member of the church is wrong. It's wrong for Christians to exercise dominion over other Christians. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 27, our Lord said this, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. Now listen how plain this is. But it shall not be so among you. The kingdom of heaven is different. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Matthew 20, again, verses 25 through 27. Now, the word here is katakudio. And it means to try to show one's authority over. You consult any of the Greek lexicons and you'll see that. To try to show authority over. And students of the New Testament concerning the New Testament church will recognize the practice prohibited in relation even to the role of elders. They're not to be lords over God's flock. They rule in the area of what's expedient, what's advantageous to carrying out the church's obligation, and in doing so, they have to do so knowing what the church can do. It would be, this is extreme, but it would be highly ridiculous, absurd, and silly even for the elders here to say, now, the last Sunday of February, we're going to give a million dollars. We expect all of you to dig down deep and let's give it. And if you don't, we're going to exercise dominion over you, at least to the point that we're going to say you didn't obey the elders, and we're going to withdraw fellowship from you. Well, I say that's ridiculous, but there are things that happen sometimes like that on a less ridiculous view because elders can go astray and they can bind things on people. That just are ridiculous. Now you say, well, such as that would never happen. In the great apostasy of the church in the first 300 years that it existed, 
and that's one of the values of studying church history at that time. They did things like that. They were that tough in the dictates as to what you could say at a certain time over a certain matter and what you couldn't, all of that kind of thing. It gets rather interesting to see that. Uh, I'll say this in passing. It has no direct bearing on this business of why uh, that faithful Christians don't call their preachers reverend. But the Council of Nicaea took place in 325 A.D. And it was the beginning of saying, we've got to have something here, since they'd rejected the New Testament as authority, to determine who's faithful and who's not. It's it rather interesting to see how all that came together. And then what happened over the next many years, because what it established was the kind of thing I'm talking about. You can't do this and this and this. You can't do that. They didn't have any more idea than people do today of the proper authority of the Scriptures or how to ascertain it. And they had already gone a long way down the drain of apostasy before they'd ever do such a thing as what they did in the Council of Nicaea. It just compounded after that. So, we need to understand there's a difference in obeying the authority of the elders and what the elders are to bind on the church in the area of what's most expedient advantageous to discharge the obligations God has put on the church, whether they're elders or not, by the way, and in just demanding that something be done in such a way because that's the way I want it and I like it better and I think I know more than you do and we're going to do it. Now, you can see that kind of thing even when Paul warned the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. The men shall arise from among you teaching perverse things. Not the truth, but perverted things. To draw away disciples after them. So you have to be aware of that. And it happened in all those warnings that men left the truth. And thus the first by 150 A.D., uh, departure from the truth that was quite evident was in the eldership where they gave one man more authority than they did the others in the eldership and eventually that became that the bishop had the authority and then there became uh, other bishops and archbishop all that stuff that finally out of the apostasy developed what we know as Roman Catholicism so Lord's over translates this word katakuriu and Christians don't exercise that kind of dominion. They don't lord it over other Christians, whether they are elders or not. They are told to condescend them in a low state. They are told to be humble before all men, to think of others more highly than they think of themselves, to realize the value of every soul in this room, to realize that we're all different. So we all have to understand that. And when I say different, I don't mean different in the sense that some are faithful and some are not. I mean within the realm of faithfulness, each one has their whatever. Everybody, everybody doesn't have what you have in the way of talents and ability, and I mean natural things. Some have less, some have more. And all of that is brought together and kept together by loving God, loving his word, and loving one another so that we don't do things that way. We treat one another right, and right is determined by the word of God. Now, I'm saying all this because this is how things get corrupted when you start with any one thing, just to promote one person above another. And that's the reason that a lot of times, even in the church, People will say sometimes in the hospital, where in the smaller towns people can go to the hospital, in the smaller towns where I worked as a preacher, then uh, usually the preachers want to visit the hospital. Now ask yourself a question, why? Why is it that somebody calls for the preacher? The only place I find in the New Testament that when you're sick that you're to call for anybody, call for the elders. And I don't call for the elders expecting them to heal me. If I want some healing, I go to a doctor and hope for the best. Be that as it may, you can pray about it. But the point is, we have this view of preacher, and it all comes back from the priest of Roman Catholicism. Because the priest, part of the clergy, in Roman Catholicism 
are the ones who extend through the sacraments salvation to the members. And if the priest will not let you do thus and so, you don't have access to God. And people forget that. And we never get it out of our system. And thus, even in the church, people will call for the preacher. Well, I don't mind seeing people call for the preacher if they want to visit. That's fine. But if you don't watch out, you place the preacher in a position the New Testament never does place him as far as prestige and power and honor and all that. I remember, and this was before I was married at Hampton, there were several widow ladies there. I could not go visit one without visiting all of them. Because if I visited one, before I could get out into the car and leave, that one had already called the others and told them I was there. And if I didn't show up at the others within a day or two, at least between services, between the time we met, then uh, here we go. <laughs> and there was one lady who loved being single, that works pretty well, loved to fix me a hamburger every once in a while at lunch. And she'd call me and say, you want to come over and eat a hamburger? I'm fixing it. So I'd go over. But before I went, I knew that I had to go by and see at least two other women who were about her age. Because as soon as she cooked and I ate and I left, she was on the phone. Now these are things that the blessed brethren need to undergo if they really want to know the life of a preacher. Because this kind of thing, you're, you're wide open for all spaces. I remember talking to a, a young man who grew up, his daddy was a preacher, and they lived uh, close to the church building. And, of course, the church building belongs to the church, and everybody knows that that church building belongs to every member of the church coming out and do as they please. Everybody knows that, especially in smaller towns. And he said, I got so aggravated with all the kids running in our house after services and getting a glass of water where I couldn't even find a, a clean glass to drink out of. Well, I remember a delegation coming over one time to investigate the house. And it was some of these same old ladies. And they were trying to figure out whether there ought to be paneling in the front room or not. Because it was just me there and I didn't have anything in that front room. They came over to see what they want to do about it, and they were going to put curtains in it. Now you say, what has all that got to do with reverend and calling a person reverend? It's the way you treat preachers, and even in the Lord's church. You don't have to call him reverend or treat him that way. You might as well go ahead and call him reverend. And back in the days when I was more bold than I am now, we had a wedding and a congregation, and they wanted the preacher to wear the cutaway Prince Albert coat. It had a pink shirt, and it had a frills all down here and a big... I've got a picture of that somewhere. If I thought about it, I'd try to get it today. It had a velvet bow tie and patent leather shoes. Uh, I mean, you were the cat's meow. So I thought, this is, the, this is the time for me to preach my sermon on one standard for the preacher and one standard for the church. So I came showing up Sunday morning wearing that to preach. And I did. And I preached my sermon and made my points. And I was my own illustration without even saying a thing about it. <laughs> More than one way to skin the cat, but there's no way the cat's going to like it. <laughs> and there's more than one way to make a point. What I'm saying is, if we don't watch out, we don't have to say, well, you shouldn't call the preacher reverend and get all over the denominations for it. No, they shouldn't. But that's in, that's in their doctrine. You can expect that out of them. What about us? Well, we have all sorts of other ways of doing that without ever. In other words, we can condemn somebody for calling a preacher reverend and then in our actions do almost the same way. I have a picture somewhere in my files and it wasn't done by any member of the church, but I've kept it all these years. It is a picture of a family, and they're in their living room type setting right in the middle of the aisle right here. And all the members are sitting in pews like this, and they're all looking at them. And that's the preacher and his family. <laughs> 
So it's always been something like that. And those people haven't experienced that, then they have missed a great deal of education in life. There's another point as to why calling a person reverend is wrong. People are taught over and over again in the church to assign and wear religious titles even when the motivation for doing so is esteem and respect because here's what Jesus said. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, Matthew 23, 8 through 10. I've seen people announced this way. Joe Blow will lead singing. Brother John Jones will do the preaching. And Dr. Peter Black will do this and so. Well, I know when you've got an earned doctorate and whatever it might be, it's an earned doctorate. Somewhere, some academic institution had people who are qualified to say that if you go through this series of studies and accomplish it rightly, we will confer upon you whatever doctorate it is. And it's usually a rigorous task to reach it. I have no problem with that kind of thing. I do have a problem with somebody having a Ph.D. in history and he's a preacher, too. In fact, that's what he does. He preaches. And so they want to call him doctor because he's a preacher. They don't care about his history. Nobody cares about history but historian. But they want to call him doctor because he's our Dr. Brown. We've got a smart man. That won't work, and it goes right against what Jesus taught here, and people don't see that, don't see a lot of things. Another point is it's wrong for man to call himself God, and that's precisely what we're doing when we say reverend. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4, the scripture reads, concerning great falling away, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In other words, we, we as Christians don't want to do that kind of thing, whether it's actually calling us God or not, except Roman Catholicism. The Pope is God's vicar on earth, and he sometimes calls Lord God the Pope. Because when he speaks in his official capacity, he calls ex cathedra, then that is a pronouncement of heaven, just like the writings of your New Testament. We got away from all that. It's what we're trying to do. We're trying to follow Jesus and how we ought to think of one another in the church as brethren in the Lord. We all have different assignments. Some qualifications have to be met for some of them. But nevertheless, we're all just simply doing our work we can do according to our several talents under the authority of Christ. It's wrong to refuse to speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4.11. Thus, we don't want to be called reverend for the various reasons I've said and because we want to speak as the Bible teaches. It should be sufficient for us to say, uh, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Now, when I was in college and there were men there in a collegiate academic atmosphere, uh, I might call them doctor, and I did. But I just as apt to be calling them brother, which I did that too. But we're not talking about when it comes to everyday operation of the church and attitude one toward another and how God said we should keep it the way he wants you. You know, these things in the Bible, for some reason, they teach an attitude. They teach a viewpoint we have of one another. And that's the whole thing. It's wrong for men to set anything into the church that's not authorized by Christ who is the head of the church and has all authority. Paul taught that God set some in the church. He said he put apostles, prophets, and teachers, but I can't see that he ever put a reverend in because God alone is reverend. 
1 Corinthians 12, 28, and Ephesians 4, verse 11. Seven, and that's the seventh point, if I haven't been counting, this is my seventh point. <laughs> it is wrong for men to elevate their doctrines in general. Men like to do that. And the assigning and the wearing of religious titles in particular to the level of God's commandments. You may or may not remember those that were there that we in the debating Dr. Callum, who is formerly known as Father Callum in the Catholic Church, that we would not be calling him that. And we use such passages as we did here because we're to call no man father on the earth. I did not mind calling him a doctor because he had earned Ph.D. That's no problem. And he taught and, and does, I don't know if he's still alive or what he's doing, but he did teach in the Catholic University here in town. So I don't have any problem with that. But I'd hate to know my name stuck on a sign as the preacher with the doctor after it because of what being on the, on the sign as a preacher means to the world round about. Jesus taught, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, Matthew 15, 9. And all he taught on the attitude we ought to have one toward another, and the lowest will be, and the one that serves the best will be the greatest. Because we're not like kingdoms of the world. The next one is it's wrong to refuse to abide in the doctrine of Christ when we use the word reverend. The disciple whom Jesus loved wrote this, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of both the Father and the Son. Second John 9. The next one, and this is the next to the last, and on my outline it's nine. <laughs> we should not forsake the apostles' doctrine because we are if we wear titles that we're told not to wear. We're to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. And you can't find in the apostles' doctrine, the New Testament of Christ, any authority to use the word reverend as a title for mere men specifically because they're preachers. And the last one, it's wrong to add wearing the title reverend to the scriptures because here's what the Bible tells us and in telling us warns us. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Revelation 22, 18. Now I'll just simply cite Psalm 11, 111, 9 and say, let's keep it where God put it. That reverend applies to God. It's always applied to God. It never was applied to anybody else. Psalm 11, 111, 9, I end as I started. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. That's pretty specific. Holy and reverend is his name, God's name. And that ought to let us know why we should not end up calling preachers or anybody else that way. I never did really understand why we would allow such a thing. You say, well, those following the New Testament teaching didn't. But if you go back to the 19th century when the apostasy took place and that group that finally came out of the church became the Christian church. If you go back to that time period after the Civil War, you'll find out they were calling them right reverend and reverend and pastor and all that stuff. They had completely forsaken what just a few years before they had started for, which was calling Bible things by Bible names and doing Bible things in Bible ways. In other words, if any man speak, let him speak the oracles of God. And they were content to simply call one another brother. Our sister, as the case may be. But since we're talking about preachers, then it's fine. And we don't even use that as a title. We use that to describe our relationship in the family of God as brothers and sisters in Christ. So everything 
in the whole tenor of the teaching of the New Testament concerning our attitude one toward another is not to exalt one person above another, that he's something special in the church, and I am not, or to make other people feel like they are less than somebody else. The poorest of people economically should be able to come into this building and sit right down beside the richest and feel comfortable because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We all believe and obey the same gospel. We all worship the same way. And we're all going to the same heaven. Same, same heaven. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to think about it seriously and obey the gospel. If it's a child of God, you've wandered, you slipped. We urge you to repent of your sins and pray God for forgiveness. And let this invitation song encourage you to do that while we stand and sing.